It is wonderful and such a privilege to be here and to speak with you all this evening. Um, I've only been at FCNL a few months. However, in the short time that I have been here, I have really come to appreciate just how um, fortunate I am to be at this organization. Um, every day I get to work alongside an incredibly thoughtful, smart, and dedicated staff. And I've been amazed at how much I've learned in just the past few months. Um, I know FCNL has a long history of working with young people through the internship program and um, program assistant positions. And I want to thank you all for investing, investing in young people and supporting, supporting me. Um, so thank you for laying the groundwork for me to be here tonight. Um, FCNL's work for peace and justice is closely rooted to my own personal values and my past work before coming to Washington. And I really see this fellowship as an opportunity to learn from experienced people at FCNL and then to use those skills to develop into a stronger advocate. Um, so how did I end up at FCNL? Um, I was trying to think back to the first time I heard about FCNL, and for a while I was having a hard time pinpointing that moment. Um, but then it just suddenly hit me, of course, the war is not the answer sign. Um, and FCNL has actually had a very strong um, influence in my life growing up, and I don't think I actually knew it. Um, and it was through that sign, war is not the answer. Um, and I think that message behind that sign resonates with, with many people. Um, and for me, I first saw that sign in the early 2000s, the beginning of the Iraq War, when I was 12 and 13 years old, when that sign appeared in a window of a house in the corner of a road right by my middle school. So that was a sign that I passed um, every day when my parents would drive me to school. Um, I grew up in a small rural working class town in central Maine, and my mom is an educator, and I was raised in a home where we were really encouraged to question what was going on, question the, um, the world. A very politically active <laughs> home. I attended a UU church, so I was very used to going to um, protest rallies with my family and um, boycotting. I think I, I can remember being 10 and telling my kids in my class, oh, my family boycotts this store because they don't have fair wages. So, so I was that 10-year-old kid. <laughs> but I don't think my purse, but that was kind of going along with my family, but I don't think my own personal um, political consciousness really happened until after the 2000 elections, and when I was um, 12, 13, 14, and watching what the um, administ current the administration then um, this was pushing for a war with Iraq. And I personally started paying more attention to politics and following the news more closely um, on my own. And as I said, I attended talks, I attended protests against the war with my family. So this was a constant conversation in our house. And I remember listening to the news in our car radio as I was going to school, and I would see this sign, war is not the answer. And I remember my mom saying to me, oh yeah, that, that family's Quaker. I'm glad they have that sign up. <laughs> and I don't think at the time it really registered to me what that meant to, I knew what Quakers were, but I don't think it really registered what it meant to be Quaker and to have that sign and to be making that statement at that time. Um, and I certainly didn't know that that sign was coming from FCNL. Um, but whenever I passed the house, I, I noticed that sign and it gave me some affirmation that, oh, there's, an, there's another family down the street that's also questioning this war and thinking about peace. 
Um, so today, when I walk to work every day, I get to look up the windows of the FCNO office building, and I see that same sign. So a lot of our staff have it in, in, our win in the windows. Uh, if you've walked by the building, you've probably seen that. Um, and it's a good reminder to me of that Quaker family in Maine that was speaking up for peace. And it's a good reminder that FCNL, through that bold message, was one of the many forces that really helped raise and affirm, um, I would say, my political and moral consciousness during that very you know, formative time in my life, in my early teenage years. Um, so I have a strong personal connection to FCNL's mission and values towards peace and justice. Um, but what about lobbying? What led me to do that? Because that's, that's what I do here a lot. Uh, after I graduated high school in Maine, uh, my interests in social justice carried over to college. I attended Mount Holyoke College in Western Massachusetts and was very involved in campus activism. Uh, it was not the cool type of activism. We didn't um, go to protests and marches. Uh, the activism I was involved in was campaign finance reform. <laughs> and I was on the Social Responsible Investment Committee. <laughs> and looking back on that now, the activist work that I did at Mount Holyoke looks a lot like lobbying. <laughs> Um, we were really interested in structural institutional change at the college and the students. We wanted to talk to the decision makers in the college of how we can um, come about that change. Um, and very, very briefly, <laughs> we were a group of students. We wanted the college to, uh, we were interested in where the endowment money was going. So we wanted the trustees to, to commit a percentage of the endowment money to socially restrained mutual funds and green energy and community development. So we had a very strong ask, and we would do research um, about community investment and request meetings with the trustees and start to contact alums to try to get letters that they could sign on to. I don't know if this sounds familiar to anyone, <laughs> that they could sign on to these letters to show that we support socially responsible investing, and then we would go and meet with the uh, finance committee at Mount Holyoke with the president and present our case. Um, so I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to do this work at Mount Holyoke, and I think as a student, that's when I realized that at uh, a college level, it, I had an opportunity to speak to people in power and who were making decisions. And that was a very important learning experience for me. However, my actual first lobby visit with an elected official didn't come until much later, until after I had graduated from Mount Holyoke. And after I graduated, I moved to Brooklyn, New York. So I was working in Brooklyn, and I got connected to the Arab American Association of New York, which is in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. I know I met a few people from New York here, so it's in Brooklyn and the South, uh, South Brooklyn. Um, and I was really looking for an organization that matched my interests in social justice work and advocacy work, and I found that at the Arab American Association of New York. They're a community organization that does a lot of um, social services, ELL classes, community outreach, and also advocacy work. So I wanted to get connected. And the first way I did that is asked if I could volunteer. And my first week of volunteering, the director said to me, so Catherine, this Saturday, we're taking a busload of high school students up to Albany for an immigrant day of action. And we'll be meeting with our representatives and lobbying in New York for the DREAM Act. Can you come? The bus leaves at 10 AM. <laughs> and I said, yes, yes, of course. Um, so this was 2012. Uh, the New York Dream Act, this would help undocumented students who had gone through the, uh, New York, for New York students who had gone through the school systems have access to state financial aid to help them pay for college tuition. So Saturday comes, 
and I meet this group of high school students and they're waiting and to get on the bus and we have this three hour bus ride and we go to Albany and I hear their stories and many of them were born and raised in Brooklyn and others had recently moved to the US in the past few years and what I listened and I watched them lobby and speak with their representatives. And I quickly realized that I was surrounded by a group of young people who were organizers and who were activists. And I learned a lot from these high school kids. And one thing that I think I really took away from organizing with them was how to build coalition groups. And that's something that we do a lot with at FCNL, but a lot of the skills came from learning from organizers who've been on the ground doing this work in New York. So I worked on a number of issues with the Arab American Association of New York from immigration reform, police reform, specifically around um, surveillance in Muslim and Arab, Arab American communities and NYPD stop and frisk, frisk program. And around this time, I got an email from a friend from college who said, I'm doing this fellowship in DC. I think you might be interested. And it's with the Friends Committee of National Legislation. So I opened the email and kind of looked at the issue page and said, hmm, Friends Committee on National Legislation. Um, they work on immigration. I'm working on immigration in New York. Um, so I think I signed up for a few action alerts, and which I'm sure many of you also receive. Um, and, but I was pretty set on staying in New York. Uh, but I eventually started getting emails and updates from FCNL and saw many overlaps with the work that I was doing in New York and the work that FCNL was doing here in DC. And I continued to do the work in New York and last year decided that I wanted to see how change was happening in DC, how to be a, an advocate in the lobby, how to lobby. So I applied for the fellowship and I see all my interests from my younger life in Maine through college and my young, younger adult life in Massachusetts and New York really have come together here in DC and with FCNL. Now, I'm very happy to have found this program and to work with an organization that's working for peace and for justice. And thank you for this opportunity.